the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Hi, I'm Jennifer, a co-founder of the Go Kid Go Network. At Go Kid Go, putting kids first is at the heart of every show that we produce. That's why we're so excited to introduce a brand new show to our network called The Search for the Silver Lining, a fantasy adventure series about a spirited young girl named Isla who time travels to the mythical land of Camelot. During her journey, Isla meets new friends, including King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table, and learns valuable life lessons with every quest, sword fight, and dragon ride. Positive and uplifting stories remind us all about the importance of kindness, friendship, honesty, and positivity. Join me and an all-star cast of actors, including Liam Neeson, Emily Blunt, Kristen Bell, Chris Hemsworth, among many others, in welcoming the Search for the Silver Lining podcast to the Go Kid Go Network by listening today. Look for the Search for the Silver Lining on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hello there. My name is Amanda from the Art of History podcast, where each episode we look at a work of art that can tell us a story about the past. Sometimes this involves images of historic royals, some of whom Anne has covered here. Sometimes our work of art tells us something about a certain period of time or a cultural movement. And sometimes an artwork is just really confusing and we have to get to the bottom of it. Nothing is off limits, and even I don't know where we're going next on this podcast journey. So if that sounds good to you, join us on The Art of History wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to... Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Ann Foster, and I'm joined today by Allison Epstein. Welcome, Allison. Hello. I'm so excited to be here today. So um, regular listeners of this podcast will remember, um, Allison, you were on talking about your book, A Tip for the Hangman, when it came out. When was that, like a year ago? Yeah, a year and a couple months. Yeah. And then also Patreon members will know Allison. She does the Vulgar Peace Theater. Um episodes there as well. And Allison, you're here today because we're talking about a person named Catalina de Arauso and like the Venn diagram of like your interests and this story, like somehow is a portrait of Catalina de Arauso. I'm not sure how that happens. Venn diagrams don't usually do that, but the the overlap is entire. Entire, hundred, hundred percent. Anne has been researching this person for several weeks and periodically, once or twice a day, has been texting me <laughs> saying, oh my goodness, you need to know about this. You need to know about this. And so she has brought me on almost entirely to react because she knows I'm going to love this story. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it's the thing where it's just like after a certain point I, where I'm just like, should I just send Allison like literally all my notes? Because every fact I'm just like, here's a quote. Here's a fact. I'm just like, <laughs> Allison needs to be here. This is so your shit. I can't. I'm yeah. so excited. <laughs> well, at one point I was like, wow, this should be um, like Allison's next book should be about this. And I'm like, Allison doesn't need to write a book about this because Catalina de Arroso wrote her own memoir. The book has been written. Did it for me. <laughs> It's already there. So you can just enjoy the saga. Um, so before we get into it, I'm going to talk about all my sources. So um, I listened to there's a podcast called the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast, which talks about um, lesbians in literature. And so uh, the host of that really examined the story, like the memoir itself as a piece of work, but also coming from. Uh, lesbian point of view, very helpful. And it's also just a really good podcast with a great name. Um, the Deviant Women podcast also talked about her. Um, I got information from encyclopedia.com, wikipedia.com. Uh, Allison, do you know about the Rejected Princesses website? No, but I, I would like to. Okay, so Rejected Princesses was like a Tumblr, I think is how it started, by a person whose name is like Jason Porvath, I think. Anyway, who just started talking about the kind of women we talk about on this podcast, just like, so rejected princesses, quote unquote. And so there's sort of like an, a fun illustration. Oh, I sent you that illustration. Yes. So he, he has like a fun illustration of the person and then sort of like a brief biography of them. There's two books. They're both really good. The first one is just called Rejected Princesses and the second one is called Bad Mothers. Anyway, that is where shout out to rejectedprincesses.com because when I was looking for people to talk about for this season, I was just like, I... I was scrolling through Rejected Princesses being like, who's here? What countries are they from? Because it's all like nicely sorted. And I'm just like, wait, who's this? And that is where I found Catalina de Arauso. Um, the New York Times had an article called Cross-Dressing for Success. And then my major book sources, though, is the memoir itself. So Catalina de Arauso's memoir exists um, called Memoir of a Basque Lieutenant Nun. Which... And can we pause and say that's the most yeah. incredible name for a memoir ever? Yeah, it's like it. Yeah, it says it all right there in the title. You're just like, I'm intrigued. Thank you. Juan. Yeah. So the memoir was originally published in Spanish. So the English translation I liked at, which I think is the only um, English translation translation around at the moment, is from the 1990s. And it was translated by Michelle Steptoe and Gabriel Steptoe. And um, I'll talk about their translation of it in a bit um because like anything with a translation you know thank you thank you for translating it my god like what a active service that is but you're always coming into it with some sort of point of view right because it's not just like google translate literal word for word like you're coming into it sort of going from spanish to english especially for instance in spanish the use of gendered nouns right like in spanish it's like the table the door like the book, everything has a gender. So I think it would be really interesting. My Spanish is like, <laughs> my reading comprehension Spanish is I would say, I give myself like 10% ability to read Spanish. But I think it would be interesting to read this memoir, which has got all kinds of gender stuff we're going to talk about in a book where like literally everything is gendered all the time. I think that would add an element that you just don't get in English. And then there is a biography that I also read, The Life of Catalina de Arauso, The Lieutenant Nun by Sonia Perez Villanueva. And then there's also a book called The Lieutenant Nun by Sherry Velasco. Wait, do I have it near me? It was, wait, I didn't write down the subtitle, but I need to give you the subtitle. Because I mean, this, if it's going to beat The Lieutenant Nun as a title, this must be a <laughs> heck of a subtitle. Uh, let's see. So yeah, so The Lieutenant Nun. Transgenderism, Lesbian Desire, and Catalina de Arauso. Yes. I mean, is, is the book. Um, so yeah. So um, yeah, as you can tell from everything I've said about what all those book titles are. So this is a story with gender stuff in it. So, and this, um, I don't know. I'm so removed from like what to like normal people know about history and what to just I know about history, but I feel like Catalina, the fact that you hadn't heard of her is like, okay, this is like, like you who like research like dirtbags of history, who like write historical fiction about like. <laughs> Me who is so specifically interested in people like her that I yeah. didn't know. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. So she's like super, like clearly not well known in a large context. Um, so I'm using she, her pronouns for Catalina. So this is um, the second, at, like last time, I don't know if you've caught up with Njinga yet, but I was just like, there's discussion about Njinga about like, is this like, what pronouns do we use? Like Njinga is a woman who presented as a man. Anyway. So with Catalina de Arauzo, again, there's these discussions about like, what pronouns should we use? Which is also a whole other thing we don't need to get into right now, but like looking at the person in history, how did they refer to themselves is the first rule of thumb, right? Like to be like applying, it's like, well, to me in the 20 seconds, like <laughs> the 22nd century, <laughs> um, it's like, to me, I think this is a they them situation where it's like, right, but like she called herself a sheep. So like, let's trust her. Um, Anyway, so, but this is like a lot of the the literature about this, like both the, not not her memoir, but like the biographies about her I read. There's been a lot of discussion in like queer history circles where it's like, is this the story of a cisgender lesbian? Or is this the story of a trans man? Like, what, is this a gender fluid person? And it's like, maybe, <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but she calls herself a woman. So let's go with what she said. Um, but the thing is she presented as a man for most all of her life from age 15 on, except for a couple little bits we'll get to. So it's just kind of like the opening sentence of the book, she genders herself as female. So like, let's go with that. But then also it's like, well, and this is where some of the writing, like it gets so like academic-y and like about it where it's like, right but she was writing this book for general audience and what a general audience they wanted to read about the woman who dressed like a man. Like, so of course she's going to be like, I am anyway, but then she, her pronouns, um, (laughs) (laughs) executive decision based on what she used. Yeah. That sounds fair to me. (laughs) Except for in the book, sometimes she does use male pronouns. Um, but in sort of a inconsistent manner, but then it's like, did she write the book or did she, did someone just write down the book and she spoke it and did the person writing it? You know, it's just kind of like, okay, I, yeah, executive decision. Um, but then also, um, yeah, I don't want the whole queer aspect of it to be like, is super, that is an interesting part of the story, but also Katerina, Catalina de Arauso was like such a messy person who lived for drama, chaos personified, where it's like a lot of the literature is just like, what, what was the sexuality of this person? It's like, that's worth discussing, but like, that's maybe item like four on a list of 500 things I want to talk about for this yeah. person. No, There's exactly. Someone. Exactly. It's uh, to me, it's the equivalent of being like, okay, so here's Fred again. It's like, but what was she like as a mother breastfeeding where it's like, I, I'm sure she did that, but like, what about when she put, killed all those people, you know? Anyway. Yeah, like for me, I enjoy reading about historical queer people just because they're so hard to find. So many historical records can just kind of like brush off that with the classic, you know, they were just very close friends who yeah. spent their whole lives together. And so it's nice to have a historical figure that, you know, this is a queer person who we are talking about. But I also want to read about messy queer people who did ridiculous things. And I want to know about the ridiculous things more than anything. Exactly. So that was just a perfect segue for the podcast. I think I played the ad for them a couple of weeks ago, um, the Historically Very Good Friends podcast. Which is the best title. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because that, that's such a thing that you come across. Yeah. It's like, well, I guess they're just very good friends. And it's like, maybe they were. And maybe they also were in love with each other. Um, anyway, but sorry, I just want to also just say, because um, I use this term in the Njinga episode as well, just like queer history seems to be, to me, a straight woman. Um, the term that like academic scholars, podcasters, people like this is just the term we're using for stuff in the past. That's like not um, people and events. It was like, well, this is clearly not like a cisgender straight person. Who were they? We don't know. So let's just see. It's like an umbrella term, right? Instead of just being like, because you don't know like the cultural what term would they have used? It isn't it something like wasn't like homosexuality was just invented like as a term in like the 19th century or something like. Yeah, it was like, gender identity and sexual orientation as we know it now is like really, really recent, like past 150, 200 years, like to be upfront. Most of my knowledge of this is I was researching like Elizabethan queer history. That's where my my 
area is. And it's all very hand wavy. No one really talks about like, oh, this is a gay person. It's just, these are things that you did and feelings that you had, but no one really crystallizes down to an orientation until like the 1850s, 1860s and your classic Victorian need to categorize things. So, yeah. Yeah, so exactly. And so there's like lots of cultural contexts where like with Njinga, for instance, where it's just like, yeah, she had these like third gender mystics who like followed her around or it's like and she like people who like she it's like, well, to be powerful, I need to go by the word king. So I'll just call Mm -hmm. myself king. But it's like, but does that mean she was trans or whatever? It's like, I don't know. But it's like in that cultural context, that wasn't the question. So to apply sort of our lens to be like this person was this. So in the absence of a specific label that the person would have given themselves, I'm just going to, from this podcast, um, spoiler, the next like two people I'm going to be talking about, we're just going with queer as like a catch-all term to just be like person in oldie times who like clearly was not living what we would consider now to be a cisgender or heterosexual life, but like what flavor, we don't know. Like just, it's a, yeah. Hard to, what, hard to define past events using current terms so exactly yeah. but yeah but also like I am really also super interested and I've been listening to so like the historically really good friends podcast there's one called um history is gay um and anyway so just like learning for me oh there's the bad gays podcast recommend that for you my favorite um, kind of gays. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so it's like this history is important and, I, and it should be discussed. And I don't want the fact that like I there's not a specific label to apply to a person to stop anyone from studying it. Because, yeah, like you said, like this, these are interesting. These are interesting people because of the queer elements, but also <laughs> like 5000 other reasons that we're going to get into. Um, OK, so. We're going to begin this story. The way that she begins her autobiography, which is I, Doña Catalina de Arauso, was born in the town of San Sebastián in Guipúzcoa province in the year 1585. And I'm going to stop her right there because she maybe was born in 1592. <laughs> <laughs> so this really illustrates the story itself has a lot of place names and a lot of people names and a lot of dates. But also a lot of just like inconsistencies so it's it's really just kind of like vibes it's about vibes with her it's kind of like I was the biography I think she lists like this person it's like I met the governor and it was this person and a lot of that is like verifiable and it's like true and I think she she put that in so people is sort of like fact checking herself um but there's also a lot of stuff that is like did that happen like that okay but that's the issue with any person writing their autobiography. You know, it's like, really, did you remember exactly what everyone said in that room? And then she sighed despondently. Like, really? Is that, you know? But you don't remember the despondent sigh you gave 15 years ago? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So right away, it's like, what is truth? <laughs> <laughs> Starting off light with this one. Yeah, exactly. But again, so, and then, so reading because there's like one source document and everyone's just all talking about this one biography, it's kind of like, can we trust what she says about herself? And it's like, well, we can trust what she says about herself as much as we trust what like anyone said about anyone in anything. Right. right? It's like, I trust her about herself as much as I trust like whoever was writing what about like Queen Elizabeth the first, like everyone has an agenda. And for her, we're going to score, you know, a thousand hours from now. But like in terms of scandal, it's like we know she did a lot of stuff. And then some of the stuff where it's like, did she do that? It's like, I don't know. But she wrote in a book and she wanted people to think she did. Which also speaks to her character. Right. And I know on past episodes of this podcast, you've heard potential things that are maybe not true and always decided to believe the most scandalous thing, which is also how I approach history. If it's out there, I want to believe it because it's bananas. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I'm just going to have like a side note um, because I don't know about you, but I did not until a couple weeks ago know much about the Basque people. So a little sojourn. So because she was a Basque woman, um, but also Spanish. So even in her identity, it's like, which is more? So the Basque country is an autonomous community in northern Spain and southern France near the Pyrenees. The Basques have a unique culture, language, and many traditions that differ greatly from their Spanish and French neighbors. And they are, in fact, one of the oldest ethnic groups in Europe. 
And this is because of where they're located, kind of surrounded by mountains. No one could really wanted to bother going there to like attack them or like take them over. So they just kind of like developed on their own. They survived invasions from the Romans, the Visigoths, um, the French, the Spanish. In 1516, the Basques on the Spanish side of the Pyrenees agreed to be part of Spain as long as they could partially govern themselves. And that's where she is from. Their language, the Basque language, also called Euskara, is one of the oldest languages that is still spoken today because there are, of course, still Basque people today. Basque is not related to any other Latin language and is completely unique. And still today, the region is known as the Basque Autonomous Community. And it's kind of like arm's length from Spain itself. And I remember when I took Spanish in university, my teacher, her father was from Spain. So I was learning Spanish in like a Spain based way. And she described it, this may not connect with you, but to my Canadians out there, the Basque region, she described it as like the Newfoundland of Spain. And we were all like, got it. Yeah. Um, I don't think there's a place like that in the US that's like so fully itself. <laughs> like, <laughs> wait, I don't want to get my facts wrong, but Newfoundland only joined Canada in like the 1940s. Like what they were you doing before that. <laughs> I mean to see. But anyway, Newfoundland was like they're their own thing. They have their very distinct culture and they see themselves very separately. Anyway, so the Basques. This is important, Allison, because <laughs> she's gonna run into some Basque people in her adventures, not in Spain. And every time they're just like, oh my God, you're a Basque person. And they're just <laughs> like Basques united. And they like always support each other. So that part of her personality is really key. Um, yeah, they're always really excited to see each other. It's like, oh my God, you're Basque too? It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let me see. So her biography as well. So she wrote and or dictated it like while she was alive, but it was not actually published until 1829, which is 180 years after her death, which, but it also leads to sort of the questions about the authorship of the autobiography um, because it didn't come out while she was still alive. So no one could like ask her about it while she was still there to ask questions about, but like, we know she existed. We know a lot of the stuff is true. Uh, the memoir itself, <laughs> I was asking you about this. I was like, you took an English degree, you know, about the picaresque novel. I was like, I've never heard that word before. <laughs> <in my life." laughs> the other podcasts, I don't know. They talk about it where I was just like, I did not do an English degree. I did a history degree. And I'm like, wow, all these podcasts are talking about the picaresque novel. I'm like, I guess all the English people know about this, but no. So the memoir itself is written very much in the style of popular books of the era which is again, like the late or like the 1600s. So if you think about a book like Don Quixote is a very famous picaresque book. So in Spain, these are books where it's kind of like about a person who's like not a noble person, someone who's kind of like on the outskirts of society in some way and having adventures. And every chapter it's like, and then I met this person and this happened. And the next chapter is like, and then I met this person and this thing happened. So it's, kind of like a innocence abroad sort of thing, just like a person who's like a very like, um, not an extremely well-educated person, but like an interesting person having adventures. So her book, it very much ties into the picaresque tradition, which is where people are like, it was all made up where it's like, no, because a lot of this stuff did happen and there's facts. But it also is in some ways similar to, there was adventure novels, like people or memoirs of, Spanish people who went to the new world and wrote about their adventures. So it's also in that style a little bit because spoiler, she goes to the new world. Um, and then it's also at this time, another third kind of popular book was like memoirs written by nuns. And so it also is in that tradition. So the book itself is just kind of like, what genre is the book? You know, it's like <laughs> everything. About her life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> everything about her life is like, it's never just one thing. So had this come out, it would have been a sensation because it was really leaning into the popular tropes of the time. So with all of that place setting, Catalina de Arauso was born to parents. Her father was Miguel de Arauso, the first of numerous Miguels in this story. Um, and her mother was Maria Perez de Arce Gallarega, both of whom have been born and lived in San Sebastian, which is a city in Basque country. So it's on the Bay of Biscay which I mentioned just because there's a lot of ship-based things that happen. So it's like a port area. It's not landlocked. It's 
so ships were happening there. Miguel was a captain and military commander of the Basque province under the orders of the Spanish king. So as much as possible, I tried to like connect this to other people who've done the podcast. So we can be like, I was like, oh, who's the Spanish king? Is it one who we know? Um, at this point, the Spanish king was Felipe III, who was the son of the one you know, Philip II, who is the one married to Mary Tudor and who fought against Elizabeth with the Armada, etc. Armada Philip. Yes. Yeah. So it's like Armada Philip's son, also called Philip, um, all descendants of Inez de Castro. So timeline wise. So she was born in either 1585 or 1592. So she says in her memoir, she's born in 1585, but then like her baptismal certificate exists and it says 1592, but like maybe she was baptized when she was older. I don't know. But just know in the same date range, both Njinga and Francis Howard were both born at the same time. So just imagine the world of that time, like Njinga, Francis Howard and Catalina de Arauz are just all living, you know, breathing the same oxygen. There's so much, so much tits out energy in the air right now. I know. I know. I know. I don't know if you look like astrologically, like the horoscopes of that time where it's just like, ooh, like something's happening. In the born world. under the planet of tits out. <laughs> yeah, very much so. So it's that same era. Um, so the Spain in which she was born. So men's and women's roles were defined by religion, which was Catholic um, and the rules of that time which were thought women should be enclosed and confined either in the house or in the case of married women, oh, sorry, in the house, if you're married, if you're not married in the convent. So like young girls were in the convent, widows would go to the convent, like women were just kind of kept away. So this is like her gender transgressions are playing out in a very highly like binary gendered society. So the thing about Catalina's father is when he was a soldier, gravely wounded in battle, he made a vow um, to the Virgin of Atocha. The Virgin of Atocha is a statue in Madrid dating back to prior, uh, prior to the 12th century. Um, today's statue is still there. It's like a little Madonna type statue with an enigmatic, enigmatic smile on its face. Nobody knows where it came from. Ooh. Um, but everybody from the, this is a quote, from the gold braided officer to the ragged street urchins pay her the most polite respect and give her most unqualified love. So he is clearly in a battle somewhere near Madrid. He made a vow to this little statue and his vow said, um, if you allow me to survive these wounds, then all of his sons will serve in the army and all of his daughters would become nuns. And he survived and he's like, well, that's what's, what's going to happen. Although I think it's wild to make a vow that's not about your own actions, but about what other people with free will will do. Anyway, so his four sons were trained to be military men and his four daughters, including Catalina, the youngest, were sent off to a convent of Dominican nuns. So she was four years old when she was sent off to Yikes. live in the convent. Yeah. Um, her aunt was the prioress there, Doña Ursula Unza y Sarasti. The names in this are really great. And I watched a lot of videos about how to pronounce things. And please know I'm doing my best. So yeah, so age four, sent off to the convent and she stayed there until she was 15 and it did not go well. So it was a real like, um, how do you solve a problem like Maria slash Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act type yes. scenario in that she did not want to become a nun. Her personality was not um, complimentary to a nun-like life. The nuns did not like having her there. <laughs> <laughs> they got this five-year-old child and they're like, absolutely not, not this Yeah, one. this is not, oh God, no. Um, but so Asterix, the Dominican order that she was staying with, like in terms of like convents to be in, was not as severe as some other ones. And it allowed certain liberties, especially to privileged girls of noble backgrounds like her. So they were permitted limited contact with the outside world through visits um, and an allowance for maids and the possession of money. So this would be um, potentially because she was sometimes able to interact with people from the outside world she's like oh the outside world that seems better than the convent <laughs> yes let's go with that so the book really gets started when she's 15 years old um and so she's getting ready to take her vows to like officially become a nun she did not want to do that obviously anyway so in quick succession she got in a fight with another nun also yes. named <laughs> nun fight yeah, so this is like page one, nun fight. Um, 
So she got in a fight with another nun, also named Catalina, who was a widow. So who had like come there after her husband died. Other Catalina was larger and so had the advantage. Oh, this was St. Joseph's Eve, March 18th, 1600. So crucially, everyone in the convent was going to midnight prayers. So Catalina ran into her aunt, the prioress, who was like, oh, Catalina, can you just like go into my room, grab this thing real quick and then come bring it to me? Here's the keys to my room. And Catalina's like, OK, um, so she went to the room, grabbed like whatever the thing it's like a Bible or whatever. And then while she was in the room, she was like, hmm, dangling there. She sees the keys to the entire convent just like hanging there. She's like, OK, so she left the door open when she left, like didn't lock it behind her brought the thing to her aunt and hatched her escape plan. So midway through this like midnight hymn sing, she went to her aunt and she was like, Ooh, I'm sick. Could I be excused? So then she went back to her aunt's room. (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm preemptively thinking how delightful (laughs) this is. So she went back to the aunt's room and she not only took the keys to like escape the convent, she also took a pair of scissors and a needle and thread, some pieces of eight, which are silver coins, um, some fabric, and then ran away. And I'm going to quote from her right now. I went out into a street I had never seen without any idea which way to turn or where I might be going. I struck out in which direction I cannot say and came upon a chestnut grove just beyond the walls on the outskirts of the convent grounds. And so then for the next three days, she just did a pretty and pink inspired moment. She cut her hair off, um, refashioned her clothes into a doublet and house by using the needle and thread and scissors um and then made her own little boy disguise so just three days sitting in a chestnut grove just like sewing um her own little makeover montage but yeah. out in the trees after uh did she win the nun fight by the way no i don't think she did i think okay. the bigger catalina uh, overpowered her but yeah so that she's just out there just like for three days just like munching on like herbs and berries um <laughs> And then with this is all done. And then she set off in boy disguise. And this is where, like, depending on who you read, it's like, to me, it reads very much like boy disguise versus like, and now she set off her true self. Like, mm, this is very much treated by her like a disguise. Um, and so she went up in the town of Vittoria, having eaten nothing but herbs and presented herself as Francisco de Loyola, which was her pseudonym and fun fact. This is, this is like her main pseudonym, but she has other pseudonyms as well, which include Francisco de Erauso, Alfonso Diaz Ramirez de Guzman, Antonio Erauso, Juan de Arriola y Arauco, and Pedro de Orive. So I like she, having a, a range of pseudonyms that you can put on like, oh, it's a Wednesday. I feel like today is a Pedro day. Yeah, I know. The best one of them to me is Alfonso Diaz Ramirez de Guzman. <laughs> so many last names. I love it. I know. I know. It's like if I was 15 and ran away, I would also choose a name with like 17 parts to it. So <laughs> now, so this is really setting the scene for kind of like how her story is going to go, which is very much in the picaresque tradition, which I know you know all about. Um just kind of like meeting a person, having an adventure. Next, like some of the chapters in the book are like a page and a half long. And half of that is like names. So, and there's just a lot of like happening upon people who want to help her. So she clearly was like a highly charismatic person. So she met a doctor of theology who took her in and gave her new clothes. She also, so just remember about like clothes were so expensive at this point, right? like to have a suit of clothes like it was culturally so from what i understand in spain at this time it's like um it was i don't know if it was illegal but certainly offensive if you were like a poor person and you wore rich people clothes because like the clothes literally the clothes make the man or whatever it's like if you dress like that then that's like impersonating a higher class person yeah in some cultures that was definitely illegal like carrying carrying a sword or wearing a certain color of fabric above your social stage and that was that was an actual crime, which is wild. Yeah, exactly. So like the fact, so her, and that's where she's like, I'll put on these clothes. And that means everyone would treat her like a boy, but then, you know, her, her clothes were not, you know, <laughs> their clothes she sewed for three days in a chestnut I, patch. I feel really bad for her because she put so much effort into fixing those clothes. And then this doctor of theology is like, you look ridiculous. Let me give you some better clothes. Yeah. So he gave her some new clothes. Um, so the doctor of theology now, was married to 
one of Catalina's other aunts. There's the family. This is like, I would not at all challenge anyone to make a drinking game of every time Catalina runs into a relative, but if you did, Godspeed. Um, so one of the things that people criticize or question about her thing is like, how could she possibly run into so many relatives all the time? And it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> it was a big family. Um, it was like, a cat. I'm sure everyone was having 25 children and everyone's related to everyone. Anyway. So the doctor of theology was married to one of her other aunts. The aunt did not recognize her in disguise, but probably this is a thing too, where it's like, yeah, she was sent to the convent when she was four. Like a lot of people hadn't seen her since she was four. And now she's dressed like a boy. Even so, if she wasn't dressed like a boy, like if I haven't seen my aunts in 20 years, I probably don't know what they look like. No, exactly. Yeah. This is like, so side note, do you know what all the story of the return of Martin Gare, the French story? That sounds so familiar, but I don't. <laughs> there is a musical um why. anyway it's a story about a man who like left a village um went off to war he was like really unpleasant and then someone came back to the village and was like it's me i'm martin Gare." and i was like oh my god and he was like really nice and kind and the wife is like yep that's totally the guy who left me um, <laughs> and then eventually the real guy came back and he's like Rah! um it's a great story um there is a movie about it starring jura de Perdue. of course there is <laughs> because it's a French historical story. Anyway, so I studied that story in university and I remember just asking my professor, I was just like, but why? How could anyone not know it was him? Like, it's, why would everyone believe it? And she's like, well, like people didn't really, there wasn't mirrors, there wasn't photography. Like if you hadn't seen somebody in 10 years and they came back, it's like, hey, it's me to be like, okay, like, sure. Like, yeah, why not? Anyway, so she stayed with the doctor of theology and her aunt. Um, he taught her Latin. He was like, I want to teach you Latin. He was very passionate about it. And so she stayed I don't there. I how for- she got through 11 years in a nunnery without learning any Latin. But I imagine she probably wasn't paying super close attention. It's true. Yeah. She did learn sewing, though. So that's true. Um, so she stayed there for three months um, until the doctor of theology laid hands on her. So I guess, I don't know, tried to get in a fight with her now. Here's the thing I'm going to say. <laughs> Catalina de Arauso winds up in a lot of fights to the point where you're like, is someone this unlucky or are you somehow instigating all of these fights? So I'm not saying that was the situation here. You know, she was a young, <laughs> a young ex novitiate disguised as a boy. And this was an adult man anyway. But this also shows like he, I guess, hit her or whatever. And she's just like, that's it for me. I'm gone. And then she left. So, and of course she stole some money before she left. Good for her. Which will become her signature move as well. Um, so then she headed next to Valladolid by hiring a driver. So this is where the Royal court of Spain was at the time. And she got a new job as a page to the King's secretary, a job that also gave her new clothes. She gets a lot of clothes. Um, so, She's going undercover at this point, Francisco Loyola, which by the way, Loyola is a very common surname in Basque country. So she was, she was disguising her gender and her name, but she was still a proud Basquero. So anyway, so she's hanging out there. And then one day her father, Miguel arrived. Do you know what he was doing? Doing. Looking for his runaway daughter. (laughs) I thought he was going to be making another vow to a statue somewhere. (laughs) No, he was just kind of like, going around the countryside, I guess, being like, hey, so one of my daughters ran away, um, but he didn't recognize her because he probably also hadn't seen her since she was four. And why would you, as like a nobleman, pay much attention to the like page of whatever? Anyway, but she's like, it's a tight, tight escape. Let's just like time to move on. So she made her way to an inn and then headed the next day to Bilbao. Once there, some of the town's youths menaced her. Oh, no, they menaced her. I'm not sure if they threw rocks at her first, but she certainly threw rocks at them because she got arrested for throwing rocks at them. Uh, she was in jail for a month until the boy who she had hit with a rock recovered, at which point I guess they're like, that's not a crime anymore because he's fine. So then <laughs> she headed to Estea, where she again found work as a page for two years. So this is a story where it's like, were this made into a movie, which it has been, and we'll talk about that in part two. This would be a movie comprising like 40 years of time. It's never just like, I hung out there for two weeks. It's always like, so then two years pass. Okay. 
Eventually, she got bored and left, and she went where? To her hometown of San Sebastian. That's a choice. That sure is a choice. Where she lived in disguise as a young man, and nobody recognized her. This is the thing where it's like, how, I don't know, like, you send your children off to the convent when they're four, to the point that, like, when they go missing, you don't even know what they look like. Anyway, like, she went to the same church where her family went to church. Like, she saw her mother at that church, but nobody recognized her. It had now been three years since she ran away. So she's now 18 years old. And then she went to the port um, and she paid for passage to Sevilla, where she met a captain who was heading out to sea, escorting some galleons to the Spanish conquested lands in South America. Catalina got a job as a ship's boy. Yes. <laughs> Proud of her. And do you know who that captain was? That captain was her uncle. Oh my God. <laughs> um, captain Esteban Aguino, her mother's first cousin. I would like, I, we should be keeping track of the uncles. Like, I like, want to keep a tally of this. Like, we're already at three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, making an uncle tally. Ask me again. Yeah. So she was. Yeah, you know, she raised in a convent for 15 years and then she like stayed, was with the doctor of theology. Then she was a page boy. And now she's like, well, got to figure out how to be a ship's boy now, not a skill set she had. But her uncle took her under his wing, not knowing that she was his niece. And she learned quickly. Um, I don't know if this is moving up in the ranks necessarily, but she then became a cabin boy. Um, and so they headed out to sea, uh, which went poorly because sea travel in this era yeah um lots of men died during this journey she did not her uncle did not so they came ashore at nombre de dios which is a city in panama that is still there um that was a major sort of like import export hub for spanish galleons in the new world so and the plan there was they're just supposed to like you know restock and sail back to spain but instead catalina stole 500 pesos from her uncle and then was like, hey, I just am getting off the ship. My uncle said, it's cool, you guys. And they're like, okay. And she just like stayed there. So the ship headed back to Spain and she stayed in Panama with 500 pesos. Where? She bounced from job to job. I think mostly ship-based jobs. One of the her ship jobs was on a ship that got caught in a terrible storm at sea. And everyone drowned except for Catalina, the captain, and a handful of other people. One of whom was probably her uncle. Yeah. <laughs> The cap- this captain was pleased with her work and gave her a job in one of his shops in a place called Sana in Panama. He also gave her new clothes. Okay. People just love giving her clothes. And he also gave her two enslaved men to help her and a black woman to cook for her. So now she was a business person running a little business. One day she went to enjoy a show at the theater and a man named Reyes sat right in front. So she couldn't see. I don't know if he had like a big hat on, but people in this time did wear Big hat. The hats were tremendous. Yeah, so I'm hats. imagining one of those like big conquistador hats with the feathers. Yeah, with the feathers. I would yeah. write that down in my memoirs too. I'd be really mad. Yeah. So Reyes sat in front of her, so she couldn't see. Words were exchanged, culminating, and Reyes said that she should go unless she wanted to have her face cut. But she only had her small dagger with her, not her sword, so they couldn't like fight it out properly. So she just kind of like simmered about it. But the next day. Reyes passed by her shop. So Catalina grabbed a knife and chased after him and slashed his face like, sorry, who's, <laughs> whose face were you going to cut up, Reyes? Um, She's and, such an asshole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my God. And then his friend tried to back him up. She stabbed the friend and then ran off. <laughs> but you, then, you don't wear that hat in public again, man. <laughs> <laughs> she was obviously caught and thrown in jail, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was not stealthy subtlety was not what she was going for here she ran out of no but like she like read out the shop that she runs (laughs) anyway but oh but this is also important so in like the pre what's it called the like introduction to the recent ish the 1990s translation of her memoir they're describing part of their translation was like this region of south america like with the spanish had been there for like 100 years ish was very much similar to how we picture the Wild West sort of situation. Mm-hmm. Where it's kind of like all the people there were like the worst people. Like the people who left Spain to go like make their fortune there were all just like assholes, really. Just like, so the fact that she's just like chasing everybody with swords all the time, it's 
when you picture it, it's like, well, what if in the like a Wild West context, someone was chasing someone with guns all the time? Like it was that sort of thing. Like she was behaving this way, but also everyone else was behaving this way. Like this is just kind like, of what finally my colony full of assholes. This is where I belong. Yeah, very much. <laughs> Which is why when later she like really starts to stand out, you're like, okay, so in this context, she's even too much for them. Like, <laughs> so bear that in mind. So she's in jail. Her boss heard about all this, like the guy who gave her the shot, the captain or whoever. And he was able to arrange her to be freed. But the condition of her being freed was that she had to marry a woman named Beatrice de Cardenas, who was the aunt of Reyes's wife. No, does it count if it's someone else's aunt? I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> so the aunt of Reyes's wife. So I don't know if it's kind of like a thing of like, you know, we'll make a peaceful marriage based alliance. But more importantly, Beatrice was also the mistress of Catalina's boss. So. Okay. My notes here say just like, what is happening? What? Oh, (laughs) important to note throughout this whole time. Catalina had been allegedly secretly visiting with Beatrice, who apparently begged her to sleep with her, but Catalina would not. So Catalina was like, I'd prefer not to marry her. So the boss is like, I respect your decision. <laughs> <laughs> Not to want to marry my mistress. So the boss was like, okay, but it's probably best if you like get out of this town. So what if you like run my shop in Trujillo instead? And she's like, okay, so there's a Trujillo in Peru, but there's also a Trujillo in other places. But I think it's the one in Peru because she spends a lot of, yeah, yeah, because later she's in Lima. Also, I just want to shout out to any listeners listening to this in Peru. When I look at my analytics of like who is listening and where Peru consistently shows up. So like I was excited to have a Peru based story. (laughs) Now this is murder corner part one. She headed to Trujillo to work in this new shop, but two months later, do you know who showed up? I I think I do, but tell me. (laughs) The friends of Reyes. (laughs) He had a big gang. I picture him sort of like Biff in Back to the Future that he just is (laughs) There's just like goons and the, the goons are just like, how dare you? <laughs> Our big hat wearing boss can sit wherever he wants. I'm imagining this as like a West Side Story street gang, but instead of snapping, it's just large hats. Yes. Yes. Wait, this is like Peaky Blinder. It is. I wonder if they have razors in the giant hats. Yes, yes, yes. A big hat based fight. And like <laughs> at the end of season one of Peaky Blinders, I was so delighted. There's a part where like, they all had their like newsboy hats on and there's another gang and the gang all had like bowler hats on. I was just like, Ooh. <laughs> yes, I will bring up the hats. Hat based gangs. Anyway, so Reyes's friends came. There was obviously a fight. Catalina stabbed one of the men and then the sheriff came by and arrested her again. Even the fact that it's called a sheriff <laughs> is really like Wild West vibes. But guess what? The sheriff was from the Basque country. Hey. <laughs> And he was like, okay. So he's like escorting her to jail. And he's like, hey, we're going to go pass by a church. And it would be a shame if you like ran into the church and (laughs) proclaimed sanctuary. Sure hope you don't do that. (laughs) And she did just that. Quasimodo vibes. So she went and hid in the church. And it's like, well, they're all like, this is like the lawless situation. Like all assholes living there. But they're like, but we all respect the rules of sanctuary. They're like, well, can't do anything. She's inside the church. So her boss, again, tried to smooth things over, but <laughs> as I wrote- Her boss just must be so tired. Like, it's the worst employee I've ever hired. People are kind of like, hey, we're calling for reference for Francisco de Loyal. Oh, oh, you mean uh, murders one, two, and three? Well, yeah. So great obviously, job. Great yeah. job. <laughs> the one who didn't marry my mistress. Ugh. Anyway, so Catalina had just killed a man, so it was harder for him to like smooth things over. But he did. Probably bribery was involved. And in fact, she snuck off to Lima in Dark of Night with a letter of recommendation from the boss. God, I love that boss so much. (laughs) You know what? I I took out a lot of names because this book has like a lot of names. I do wish I had written down the boss's name. I didn't realize that the same boss was so consistently (laughs) there for her. We can probably safely assume it's Miguel. Yes. So in Lima, she hooked up with (laughs) new boss, friend of the previous boss, and was put in charge of a shop. But after nine months, the new boss was like, maybe you should leave. And the reason was this. She had been living, I guess, in the same house as new boss and his wife and his wife's young sisters. And Catalina had become, I'm going to use some quotes here because, and this is also, okay. 
No, I'll just read this ahead. And then we're going to have a record scratch moment to be like, what was the translators and what was actually in the memoir? Okay. Catalina had become accustomed to frolicking with these young women and one had taken a fancy to her and quote from the memoir. One day when she and I were in the front parlor and I had my head in the folds of her skirt and she was combing my hair while I ran my hand up and down between her legs. Diego de Solarte happened to pass by the window. And just as she was telling me I should go and seek my fortune so the two of us could be married. So this is like a pretty lesbian thing. I'm, I'm over here. You can't see me on the podcast. I'm just like, get it, Catalina. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Okay, so this is like a pretty lesbian thing. This is also a pretty like erotic passage. But here, okay. So in the Spanish language, it just says like, um, it translates to be like to touch her legs. The English translators were like, ran my hand up and down between her legs. <laughs> so- We're going to get into a thing that is known as the re-lesbianization era. Before that, it was the de-lesbianization era. So Catalina wrote this memoir that was very action-based, and she is disguised as a man. And so there's like, women are involved in it. She never, ever, 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 ever has any sexual or romantic thoughts about any man, ever. And I would argue to say she may not have had sexual thoughts about women, either. Like, that's not the kind of book, like, that's not the kind of book she was writing in life. I don't know what she did, but there's not a lot of interiority in her memoir. So when her story was first discovered, like brought to light in the 1800s, it was very much just like, she's like a kind of Joan of Arc-ified, where it's like, look at this woman who like dressed as a man, but for all these noble reasons. And so they just kind of like excised all the, because she was like on the side of colonialization and she's like on the side of nationalism. You, you, Anne is responding to my face being like, what noble reasons were the noble reasons killing people because of their hats? Yeah. So they, again, I don't know in the like Spanish version of this. No, I do know because I've read about the Spanish version of it. So there's nothing in the Spanish version that is like specifically lesbian. Um, A lot of the, so the de-lesbianization was not hard to accomplish by just being like, here's this book and here's this person. And like women threw themselves at her and she was always like, no, no. But then in the 20th century, um, in the late 20th century, like the 1990s, which is an insane way to talk about an era in which I was alive. What is it? God, I always forget the like waves of feminism, but the like the one in the 1990s, the like Spice Girls era, yeah, that wave. So it's like, let's study this from, but it was from a very like, let's study this from an understanding of human sexuality that's very much like not binary necessarily, but it's like, let's, oh, she's a lesbian. So let's just like treat her as a lesbian rather than what we might do today were someone to translate it again to be like, is this like, what, where does she feel like what's the gender binary of it all like what's the like bisexuality exists you know whatever but then it was just get like, a little bit of context like a yeah. little nuance and a little context here so the re-lesbianization was occurring around the same time as this english language translation which so i think they and this is the thing like any translator does and i think it's a really challenging job to be a translator because you want to look at not just like word for word you want to put some style into it and so they said Knowing that the, the, this era it reminded them of like the American Wild West. So they sort of use that a bit in their translations, like some of the way that she talks, like the way they translated it. They were inspired a bit by Mark Twain's writings, like to try and anyway. So to them, the context of this scene, it's like ran. They're like, you know, ran my hand up and down between her legs where it's like, OK, so you're coming from like a let's make her this lesbian icon point of view. Mm-hmm. Whereas which is not to say that that was not what was happening, but but we don't know. We don't know. And if that was happening, Catalina would not have written that in a memoir for public consumption in like the 1600s. I wouldn't think. Although um, she didn't seem to particularly care what people thought about her in general. But true, true. No, but, I, I what you're yeah. So it's, it's the sort of story where it's like, there's so much stuff in this. I mean, like, that's why this is going to be a two part episode, but there's also so much like, you can really fill in the blanks with what you want to see in it. Or like you could write a series of like academic type papers being like, here's my angle of this. And here's my angle of this, where it's just like, there's a lot of room for interpretation, which, so we're at a point (laughs) as we record this, 
the only English language translation that exists is this one from the 1990s. And their interpretation was like lesbian, which is not to say that was not what was happening, but something was certainly happening. She was, she liked to frolic with these women. And she said her boss happened to pass by just as the woman was being like, please go off, make your fortune so we can be married. Um, And then she was fired. So something went on. Um, And this is also like, again, I'm not, this is where you listen to like the lesbian historic motif podcast to get more about this sort of stuff. But like two women together was not seen as like deviant or bad, right? Like she got in trouble here because they thought it was a man doing this with a woman, right? Two women together could do mostly because if there's not like penetrative penis-based sex looming, then it's fine. Yeah. Like lesbianism was almost like not even considered as an option to be illegal. Like they're like, oh, I can't imagine how two women would have sex. So I will not care about that at all. That went on for ages. Yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. So it's like, it wasn't a threat if it was two women. Right. And then actually in one of the, well, the first play, the first stage version of her story, which came out while she was still alive. That's actually how, which is interesting too, because that does have a lesbian sort of thing where she was like in love with this woman. Um, and then they were caught together, but she was disguised as a man. And then at the end she had to be like, no, I'm a woman. And that like saved the virtue of the other person. So she could marry the like man character. So like, there's a lot of layers here and it's, so I, I just need to sort of like unravel my like 21st century understanding of what this would have meant or what this would have looked like. But two women together were, everyone's like, okay, like that's, there's no man. So like, I don't care what you do, like go ahead. But they thought it was a man. And so she was fired. But also whatever was happening between her and this woman, she, we're going to see over and over again had no interest in like a wife (laughs) or like settling down with anyone or anywhere ever. She is a lone wolf, Catalina. So at this time, the Spanish army was kind of like constantly recruiting people to go fight the indigenous people because there's just always just (laughs) this country full of just like Spanish assholes and who would get up to no good. And every now and then it's like, let's just like round them up and like send them off on like a little army project to just like give them something to do. So they'll stop like brawling all the time. You know what will stop our law and order problem? Colonialism. Exactly, exactly. So she joined the Spanish army to go off and fight the indigenous people in Chile. And now I did try to find the names of the groups because she gets... Um, she fights several different indigenous groups during this story, but like her memoir lists a lot of city names that don't exist anymore. And that I can't find out where they were in the first place. So I'm just similar to how I'm using like queer, like we're just going to say like indigenous people. And I'm sorry, I don't know the specific tribes. Oh yeah. While we're taking a pause, what did she look like? So a travel writer who met her, when she was in her thirties described her as she is tall and well-built for a woman. Although for her, she does not look unlike a man. She does. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Okay. She does not have breasts. She told me that since she was young, she had followed some remedy with which I am not familiar to dry them and leave them flat as they were, which was a homemade poultice that some Italian gave her when she used it, she experienced great pain, but after that, without pain or any other treatment, it worked. Now, I have so many questions. I do as well. And my first question was, <laughs> is this a thing? What? Yeah, that was also my question. And so I do have my friend who is a gynecologist who I refer to with some of the weird stuff that comes up with these. I was going to almost write her and I was just like, no, no. If there was a poultice that could shrink breasts, like the trans community would have. We would be using that now. That would be available. That would people would even if it was like, oh, this like Italian poultice, like someone would have found that by now. Right. Yeah. I I mean, what is she talking about? What is she talking about? And if there was a poultice that would like shrink or like make your breasts not grow, that same poultice could be used. I don't know now is an alternative to like plastic surgery is of liposuction, whatever. It's like apply this poultice and it'll like shrink. Like, is it like a hormone thing or like? 
I don't know. Or is she just wearing a binder and pretending? I don't know. Or is she just like a very flat chested person? Also possible. Yeah. I will say she is sent to prison countless times and there's never in the book she never is like oh no they're gonna like in Gwyneth Paltrow and <laughs> Shakespeare in Love they're like oh no they're gonna like find my like bubbies that is never so she doesn't write about her breasts in the memoir but this writer was just like, I mean yeah, I also would not write about my breasts in my memoir no, I feel like it wouldn't no, come up so. no well also well the what's interesting about her memoir that it doesn't come up not just that specifically, but like, she's never being like, she's never, never, never in the memoir is like, I was afraid I would be caught out. No, she's just like, I put on clothes, became a man. And here are my adventures. She's never like, will I be caught? It's not like a Disney's Mulan situation. Like, oh no, like, how am I going to bathe? Like, she's just like, she's fine. Do what I want. Not concerned. My theory is just, she was physiologic. She might've, you know what? Maybe she like did get a poultice and she did apply it, but she just was like a small chested woman. And she's like, this poultice made my breast not grow. It's like, or genetics. I don't know. Who's to say? I also sent you a picture of her. It's probably like back in your chats, but if you'll recall, so the portrait that was made of her was from the same time. And it's, it's an actual portrait made from life. Like that's what she looked like. Um, and she looks like, um, she's got the like Lord Farquaad from Shrek haircut, which is like the bangs and like the blunt bob. Yeah. And her, her face is like, it's a very realistic portrait. Um, it's, it's facial. She's scowling, which is like, I imagine that's Surprise. what she <laughs> Yeah. So people who met her when they knew like later on in her life, when they're like, this is a woman who dresses like a man, they're all like, oh, it's so interesting. She like, doesn't look like a woman. Hmm. Like, yeah, that's how she got away with it because she looks like a man. That's the point of what she was doing. I forget if this is in the de-lesbianization era or the re-lesbianization era, but some, I read something in one of these things about some men were like, well, women would not have wanted to, to sleep with her. Like, look at her. Like, she's not attractive. And it's like, sirs, like she's not attractive. Okay, your own portraits. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you don't want to fuck her as a woman, but like, how do you know? Like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Women have been fucking ugly men for centuries. Like, look at yourself look at your choices exactly exactly so it's like what they were saying is like i don't want to fuck her so therefore no one ever would is a pretty standard thing that people still say a lot today so she's in the army the army lands in concepcion where they're they disembarked and they were greeted by the secretary to the governor who do you want to guess who was the secretary to the governor I have two guesses. And okay. one is her old amazing boss who is getting what's coming to him. And the second guess is one of her uncles. Would you accept one of her brothers? I would accept that. That counts. <laughs> Can you guess her brother's name? Is it Miguel? Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> so it is Captain Miguel de Arauso, her older brother, who now they, this isn't just like, I haven't seen her since she was four. Like they had never met. Well, okay. He left San Sebastian to go be a soldier when she was two. So he's nope. like her, her much older brother. Um, when he met Catalina, she said where she was from. True. And who her parents were. False. And he threw his arms around her and he was like, oh, my God, another Basquero. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, more than you know, bud. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like, great. Like, I'm so excited to have another Basque person here. We can talk about like the Basque country that language that only we speak, you know, all the things. Um, so he invited her to supper at his house and then he helped her get a better job working for him because Basque looks out for Basque. Um, so the rest of the army marched out to go fight, but she stayed behind um, and worked for him as his page for three years. And he never suspected her identity. But the thing is, Miguel had a mistress who he liked to visit I, I guess that's like he, I'm going to say he was married and then had a mistress. Cause like, why would he just like visit a mistress? Anyway, Catalina started visiting that same mistress for sexy reasons or other reasons. We don't know. Who's to say? Who's to say, but she started visiting the same mistress. And then the brother found out about it, got mad, whipped Catalina with his belt. She fought back um, because here's the thing. Like she does never not fight back. Um, but then she went, <laughs> But he was like the secretary to the governor. He's like really important. She's like the page. 
Um, so she was going to get in trouble for this. So she pulled her now classic hiding in the church. Yes. But I guess her brother was just like, oh, but you know what? This guy, he's Basque. Like, I can't go against my like Basque friend here. So the brother actually helped her not have to be um, arrested for this. But she was banished to Paikabi. This was, and I, it's, I don't think it's still a place. But there was a lot of places then that's like Spanish created and are now no longer places. Anyway, so she's banished to Paikabi, which is a settlement of indigenous people in Chile. And this is where I truly do not know what indigenous people these were, because that is not a city anymore. So to quote Catalina, so there I was in Paikabi for three years of misery. And after always having led the good life. I love I, I, I'm i sorry to interrupt you, but I love her writing voice where she's just like, so there I was sitting there on the side of the road, having just almost murdered my brother. She's just. She sounds like she's on TikTok and I love it so much. You just imagine her turning on her phone in this tiny Chilean village being like, okay, so story time. Here's yeah. what we're going to do. I no, love her. exactly. Exactly. It is like a really readable memoir for a piece of literature that is as old as it is. Well, I hope so because as soon as this recording's done, I'm going to go get it. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so she describes this as after having always led the good life. Now, I don't know if she means like after always having like been a good person because like I hope not. <laughs> that is not true. But if she means like the good life, if she means like, you know, gambling and like having fun, sword fighting, she's just like, oh, here I am in Paikabi. Ugh, sucks here. But then because people are always conscripting, um, the governor arrived with an army and Catalina joined up with them to fight against the indigenous people. Not sure what group Catalina does not. Well, Catalina is just like the Indians. Well, sorry, the English language translation is always like the Indians. I'm not sure what Catalina say, said, but probably the Spanish version of that. Okay, so during one battle, one of the indigenous people rode off with Catalina's flag. And so she rode after them and stole the flag back, stabbing and being stabbed a lot en route. Quote, badly wounded with three arrows in her and a gash from a lance in her left shoulder. She got back to, wait, she got back to like her side of the fight, but then she fell off her horse. Her brother came and helped, wait, her brother's there now. Okay, why not? Her brother came, helped her out, and she recuperated for the next nine months from these like fairly grievous injuries. At the end, her brother brought her the flag she had rescued, a present from the governor. And because of this bravery, she became a lieutenant in the army. I swear. What's the flag? What what was, I I was thinking the same thing. Like, what's the point of the flag? (laughs) Why are we so excited about the flag? Why are they like, oh no, like the, the flag was stolen. And then she like almost died to get the flag back. Like, who the fuck cares about a flag? A lot of people did. Apparently a lot of people. This is the like lieutenant part of the lieutenant nun situation, right? You, we've got the nun, like she grew up in the convent. Now we've got, this is where the lieutenant comes from. And the, yeah. So then she served as a lieutenant for five years, various battles. And you know what? We know that she's good with a sword. We know that she's like good with fighting. It's sort of like, I don't even know what I'm thinking of, but you know, where there's, I don't know movies with armies and there's always one person who's like mad dog go out there and get them where there's like animal from the muppets like i feel yeah. like she's just like catalina go and she's just like she's just she's a berserker just really. go and fuck them up yeah and this is like suits her personality very well from what we know <laughs> um, i've trained my whole life just to be let loose to go slash people's faces for having weird hats exactly um, good for her for finding her place in society yeah Let's see. So during a battle, her captain fell, leaving her in command for six months. And then, and this is where you're just like, okay, we know everyone is shitty in this situation. Like, it's like the shittiest people from Spain came over here. And then the shittiest of those people went off to like fight the indigenous people in like brutal and awful and genocidal ways. Of that, she brutally murdered an indigenous person to an extent that they were like, that's too much for even us. Jesus Christ. Oh, boy. Yikes. Yeah. So she got put on half pay and didn't get a promotion she'd been expecting. Which is like the, the classic punishment for someone like that, that tracks. But Yeah. So oh. then she um, but she's still in the army. She and the army went, quote, on the rampage for six months, quote, slashing and burning indigenous croplands. Quote, but chance toyed with me, turning my every scrap of luck into disaster. 
I think we're going to pause for there. This is end of part one. Allison, I feel like everyone has a lot to think about. I know I have a lot to think about. That was a very good cliffhanger line of her memoir to end on because now I'm hungry to know what the disaster is. Yeah. Well, and she's always saying stuff where it's just like, you know, just when things like, why does bad luck always happen to me? It's like, you cause it. You're doing terrible, terrible things. A hundred percent of the time. This is your fault. <laughs> Everything that happens to you is because of your actions you chose. Oh, why is this happening? Oh, no, it's the consequences of my actions coming to haunt me again. She is that meme. Yeah, absolutely. Ooh. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, it's so much. There's so much to take in it. And also a lot of this episode was like the necessary backstory of like what this all is. So anyway, so everyone can just like take a week, think about this. Just like <laughs> if you want to read ahead, you can get a copy of Catalina's memoir. It's available as a book. It's an ebook. It's an audio book. So I know we say in the episode, you like literally just heard us say, this is going to be a two-part episode, but we said that as we were recording, and then it turns out um, there was a lot more to talk about, so this is going to be a three-part episode, so part two will be next Wednesday, part three will be the subsequent Wednesday, because there's just a lot to talk about, and we can't skip any of the weird details. So thank you so much to Allison Epstein for joining me on this episode. You can keep up with Allison on social media at RepScallison which is like Rep Scallion, but with an extra letter in it. I'll put all the links there as well if you want to follow Allison for the Dirtbag Through the Aegis newsletter. Um, and also, of course, Allison's book is A Tip for the Hangman, available wherever you get your cool books. And so you can follow this podcast or on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod, where my DMs are open. Uh, please send me your feedback, your thoughts, and if you have suggestions of people that you'd like to hear talked about on the podcast, especially if it's someone from a country that has not yet been represented on the show. I mean, I welcome all suggestions, obviously, but I really want to do as best as I can, as much as is possible to really... Um, do episodes based on all the places where all of you are listening from. Shout out to everybody in Spain, Peru, Panama. You know, we hit a lot of a lot of places today. Bolivia, Chile. Um, and also, if you go to vulgarhistory.com, there's a little contact button thing there. So you can also send me messages that way if you have suggestions. And you can buy Vulgar History merch at vulgarhistory.store. Use code tits out for free US shipping or tits out 10 for 10% off. And if you use the links in the show notes or go to bookshop.org slash shop slash vulgar history, um, then when you buy your books from there, then a little money will go towards me and not to Amazon. And I guess that's everything. Oh, no, I just want to clarify because I did say in the episode, I didn't have time to Google it at the time. Newfoundland joined um, or it became a Canadian province in 1949 and just for perspective like Canada became a country the dominion of Canada in 1867 so Newfoundland very much doing its own thing for quite a while even though now part of Canada like the Basque country in Spain I think it's uh, still got such a distinct character from from the larger country so until next week, keep your mask on and your tits out. Try not to stab anybody in the face, um, even if they're wearing a big hat in front of you in the theater. Okay, talk to you next week. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent VB Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law, her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Ah, the web tool. 
Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Jenny? This is how you deal with me! No! Do not harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, Akasa! Can, can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. I'm Laura Cathcart-Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of Only One in the Room podcast. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's incredible Only One story. We talk to the realest of real people, dealing with issues like infertility, addiction, human trafficking, and body shaming. Oh, and we want to be fair, so we talk to some celebrities, too. Oscar winners, New York Times bestselling authors, supermodels, and even the most decorated U.S. Winter Olympian. Everyone is invited to share their only one story with our listeners. This podcast is for anyone who has ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. Download Only One in the Room wherever you listen to podcasts today.